Okay. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you today. This is unusual. Uh, I know that uh, I appreciate all of your patience. It has been a challenging week, and it's not over. Uh, I know we still have another challenging week ahead with all the re renovations and things and the upgrades in the sanctuary. So uh, a lot of folks, they wanted to have Sunday school, and so we went ahead and had Sunday school, and then it's really hard preaching to nobody. You know, and so they, a lot of folks ask, can I come into the fellowship hall while you preach? And I said, sure. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to just say that to one and not say it to everybody. So we put it on the one call that if you want to trickle in here, you can. If we run out of room, you can go to the youth room. We have Jamie uh, setting up the, uh, the video if you want to watch it, if we needed more space. But I don't think we need that. We're pretty full here, but not too full. But um, uh, the carpet's being done. And we'll eventually get there. They say that building a house and renovations will make a preacher cuss. <laughs> I have not cussed yet, but I've wanted to. <laughs> so I'll just be honest with you. So, uh, But I appreciate the church's patience with us as we're trying to move through this. Uh, we're hoping things will be done this week. Hopefully, if not, we'll have to let you know. If you don't have social media, if social media is not the thing. You don't have a website. You don't have anything like that. Uh, Make sure you get the one call. I know a lot of people don't like that. We try not to bug you with the one call, but the one call is how we communicate to the church. And so a lot of folks this morning were here at 8.30 thinking there was church. And, uh, you know, they're coming in. And uh, try and get a one call. We'll try and communicate very basic, uh, in a basic way, and not bother you and not harass you, but at least get the word out if you don't have uh, the social media. And we're trying to do better as well with our website, getting information on the website to keep it up to par, which we're not there yet, but we're getting there. So uh, God is good. Amen? Amen. And uh, we've got some exciting things coming. And today I'm going to preach a very powerful message. Hopefully it'll be powerful. God makes it powerful uh, on prayer and fasting. And uh, we're going to worship the Lord together in here. We can have church anywhere. And those of you out there watching, have church in your living room, you know, and uh, listen and sing with us. As we open up the word and let God speak to you. Uh, as we things that are good. God is moving. You're moving in such a powerful way here. And Lord, I pray, I thank you for the patience of our folks. Growing pains are challenging as we move forward. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to bless and continue to reach. I thank you for the visitors that are here today. Lord, uh, you brought them here. There are many who are here, some new folks I've met this morning. Such a blessing to have them. All the visitors you can bring into our campus. Lord, I just pray. I pray that today will be a blessed day for them that you speak to them. And Lord, I pray also for those in our in our congregation that are sick, who are battling illnesses and many different things. Many who are battling unspoken requests and heavy things, Lord, in their heart. I pray, Lord, today you'll speak to them in a powerful way. Lord, we thank you for Jordan and Wendy who are here this morning in worship. We pray, Lord, specifically, you'll help them find a house in this community somewhere where they can live and start their life. Lord, I know that's a heavy burden. Lord, I just pray specifically today that you will, you will open up a place, the place you want them to have. It may not be exactly what they're looking for, but it may be the place where you want to start. And Lord, I pray that you will guide that process. And Lord, give us your vision. Give us your path.
Oh, no. 
Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Today I'm going to talk about something that is pretty hardcore. You don't hear a sermon on this very often. But I think it is necessary for the church to understand what I'm going to talk about today. If I announced that I was preaching on fasting, how many people do you think would come? Now, if I did a if I did a sermon on prophecy, revelation, man, people would want to know what's going to happen, what's going to happen. But when you preach on witnessing, praying, fasting, and how to read the Bible, you get very little attendance. But you know what the most critical thing is in the, in, to have a successful spiritual life? Witnessing, praying, fasting, and reading the Bible. That will tell us something. The interest is in things that really we have no control over. You know, Satan, it's, he's not always trying to get us to, uh, to focus on the wrong thing. He wants us to get off of focusing on the right thing. 
Does that make sense? So he, you can focus on something really good, like your children. Your, you can be so wrapped up in your family that you miss the things that really matter. Family's great, isn't it? Family's a good thing. We want to be good parents, good husbands, good wives. <laughs> Family's wonderful. But if we're so wrapped up in that that we're not doing the key fundamental things uh, to make us successful. You know, the fun part of building a house is picking the paint. Not for me. But picking the paint, picking the cabinets, picking the countertops, picking the, 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 the that kind of stuff. You know, the, the wife loves to go in, right? And they love to pick that stuff and the furniture and... You know, this is where the couch is going to be. And it, it's not fun to pick the cement blocks. <laughs> it's not fun to pick the electric wiring. You don't even pick that. You don't. My wife could care less about what the wires look like. You know, I don't care. We don't care what, you know, the HVAC pipes look like. We don't care what color the plumbing lines are. But let me tell you. On a cold morning, if you don't have plumbing lines, electric wire, and HVAC pipes, you know, uh, ductwork, you're in deep trouble. There's going to be a lot of problems. Red alert, red alert. The couch can be replaced, but if you've got the structural parts of your house that are not working properly, you're going to have a major problem in your daily life. And what it is, is this. Some of the things that I'm preaching today are the electricity. They're the wiring of a Christian successful life. They are the, this is the big part of what makes us tick. And you can live as a Christian and be, you know, mediocre. But if you want to have true movement of God in your life, it takes some disciplines. People don't like to hear that today. Ah, oh, Christianity's not discipline. It's all grace. It's grace and love. No, true Christianity takes discipline. It really does. It's the Holy Spirit driving you in that discipline. You can't do it without God. You're not doing it on your own. But there are some disciplines. Praying and fasting are disciplines. Now I want you to understand this. It is the secret to true spiritual success. It is not notoriety. It is not fame. It is not success, earthly success, wealth, knowledge. None of that makes a successful Christian. A successful Christian is found on their knees. A praying Christian is a successful Christian. Now you say, what type of success? God's success, the kind God wants you to have. You may define success as a Christian a certain way. There are many people today who define it certain ways. They may say, if you're healthy, health, wealth, the whole health, wealth movement. If you're a godly person, God will make you wealthier. God will make you... Now, that's not the success God is looking for in your life. Now, you may be, but God is interested in the intimacy with Him. And it could be that God wants you so tight with Him that people are coming to you to pray for things. Because they know, not that you're better than anybody else, but they know... That individual has a connection with God that I've never seen. Now, they can have it too. But many times, the connection with God is something that is pursued. God will let you have as much of Him as you want to give Him. And that He wants to give you. He will give you as much of Him as you want. But you have to pursue Him. It's like any other relationship. D.L. Moody was a great preacher. Many years ago, preached crusades, won thousands to Christ. You know what he said? Every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. That is so true. Every revival that was a true awakening in a nation started with people praying for months on end. Every movement in a church. We've seen many churches explode and, and win people to Christ in droves. What was the secret? They may have a pastor. He wasn't an expositor. He wasn't polished. But man, they were winning people like crazy. What was it? People were praying. People were praying. There was a fasting and a praying and a pursuit, a, deni a, a desire for God that they could not shake. And I've been here a year now, and I've been watching, and I've, and I've been praying like crazy for this church. The potential is in the pew. We have the potential. The people are there. 
We've got the young bodies, the old bodies, the bodies. I mean, we got every 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 age from top to bottom. We got it all. We got people with skills all over. But that is not. There are a lot of churches with 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 potential infusion. What makes a church different and what makes God move in it is the people that are there are so desperate for God that they are willing to put aside all earthly desires to pursue God. And when God sees that, He pours Himself out on those people. And when that happens, you see true success. The success that God is looking for in a person's life R.A. Torrey said, prayer is the key that unlocks all the storehouses of God's infinite grace and power. Prayer is the key that opens the door. Before I even start, do what I have, have had to do when I prepared this. How is your prayer life? What do you pray for? Is it a bona fide Santa Claus list? And everything on it is somewhat material in nature. And I think many times, I was this way, I shared this with our small group Friday night. I said, my prayers were awful growing up. I said, if I go back and look at some of the things I prayed for, it was so silly. I look back now and go, God, you had to be in heaven going, I'm glad you asked. I love you, but is that all you want? Is that all you want from me? You want to have a good day? You know? Lord, give me a good day. Lord, help people not to be mean today. Help my teacher to be nice to me. Help my boss to be in a good mood. Help me. You know, do, y'all, do we pray that? Lord, help me to have this happen. It's all about me, 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 me. Lord, help this to go good for me. Help me to pass this test. I used to love the professor that stood up in my seminary and he said this, Lord, we're going to pray for the test. and say, Lord, I pray these people, you give them what they deserve. <laughs> In other words, what they prepared for, you give them what they deserve. If they studied hard, I pray they pass. If they, if they didn't study, I pray you fail them miserably so they'll learn that they need to pursue the studies that I give them. And, buddy, that will shake you before you start. But, you know, every great man of God and woman in the Bible, the secret to who they were was prayer and fasting. Now, we hear a lot of sermons about prayer. Fasting is something a little more intense. That I want to share with you. Enoch walked with God every day. He was intensely communicating with God. God just took him. Mm -hmm. Moses, it says in Exodus chapter 34, verse 28, said that before God gave him the law, he fasted for 40 days. Think about that. Now, we know the human body can live 40 days without food. Not every human body, but we know that Moses did. In other words, think about that. But that's just one verse. Now think about that verse. Moses fasted 40 days before God gave him the Ten Commandments. How did he feel that day when God finally gave him the law? Probably crummy. I mean, think about it. He probably felt awful physically. But that's when the Ten Commandments was given to God, or given to Moses. God gave the law to man after 40 days of fasting. Now, some people can't do that physically. But the law came through fasting. David, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, when his child was dead, or he had not heard if his newborn baby was going to die or not, it was sick, it was struggling, said David fasted. God gave him an answer. The baby was taken. And then he went naked. But he had peace. He said, they said, now you eat, your child is dead. Before the child was dead, you, you wouldn't eat. Now the child's dead and you don't grieve. You're, you seem to be fine. He said, I have learned through this that the baby cannot return to me, but I can go to him. Through fasting, the answer came. And the peace came. There are many examples. Elijah, when, when Jezebel was chasing him, trying to kill him, he fasted. In, in Joel chapter 12, God calls Israel to fast. He says, your nation is a wreck. But 
The people of God need to fast and pray, and then I will come and listen. You see in Esther chapter 4, when she had to go before her husband and plead for the life of her Jewish friends and family, she fasted. You see in Matthew, Jesus fasted for 40 days. Jesus, before he tangled with the devil in the wilderness. That's why the devil tempted him with bread. He was hungry. Paul in Acts 9 fasted after he went blind. God blinded him and he was waiting on Ananias to come and heal him. He didn't know who was coming, but he fasted and prayed, seeking God. Cornelius in, in Acts chapter 10 was fasting even though he didn't know how. He just wouldn't eat until God revealed himself because he wanted to be saved so bad. He wanted the answers. And God sent him Peter. The elders at Antioch in Acts chapter 13, we always miss this. Before they sent Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. It says the leaders of that church fasted and prayed because they didn't know which guys to send. And in the fasting and the praying of that church, God pointed out two men he wanted to send. Paul and Barnabas. And they laid hands on them after fasting and sent them. Fasting is imperative, but I'm going to talk about one guy today. This chapter, there's two chapters, several chapters here. Nine, chapter 9, 10, 11. Most people skip them because they're really difficult to read because it's apocalyptic literature. It's a vision that God gives to Daniel showing him the end times. It's a great service, it's, or it's a great chapter because it gives us a lot of, it's, it's really like Revelation stuff. But most people read it to get prophecy. But what we miss about Daniel 9 and 10 is all of those visions came because one man was fasting. Fasting. People say, God, don't talk to me. I wish God would talk to me like you talked to Abraham, like you talked to Daniel, like you talked to... Then I'll say, okay, when was the last time you fasted three weeks? Because Daniel fasted three weeks before God talked to him. Three weeks. And here we see an example of true fasting. Beginning in verse 1, it says, In the year of Darius, the son of Azaharius, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over all the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books, this is very important, the number of years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the prophet, that he should accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And I'll make all this, this all make sense in a minute. And I set my face unto the Lord God. To seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and I made my confession and said, O Lord, great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto the, your servants, the prophets, which spoke in your name to our kings and our princes and our fathers, to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteous belongeth, righteousness belongs unto you, but unto us confusion of faces. And at this day, the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all of Israel that are near and that are far off, through the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespasses, that they have trespassed against you. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings and our princes and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongeth mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed your voice, the voice of the Lord, to walk in his laws which he has set before us by his servants, the prophets. Father God, I pray today that we will learn how to pursue you in a deep way. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's the context. Israel, years before, were a great nation. They worshiped God. But God told them, if you turn from me, I'll take the country from you. Your enemies will come in and conquer you. And God told Israel 
that every seventh, every, on the seventh year, they'd have six years that they would plant their crops. And on the seventh year, they'd take a year off. Wouldn't that be great? You work six years, and one year you just travel, you know, just take it off. That's what God wanted Israel to do. They called it the year of Jubilee. He said, I want that ground to rest. I don't want it to be messed with. Let it replenish. That was, there was a, really an agricultural reason. Because the ground produces more when you let it lay. And he, so he said, I want you to take six years and work it. And on the seventh year, I want you to let it lay. And so, but Israel, as they moved away from God, they started working that seventh year. And they started cultivating that ground. And they started hiring people to come and cultivate. They started disobeying God. And he didn't think nothing of it. And for... Many, 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 many years, 490 years to be exact, they disobeyed that, that law. Among other things, they began to worship idols, they turned from God, they went away, and finally God sent the Babylonians in, they conquered Jerusalem, leveled the city, took all these people prisoner, took them out, and God told them in Jeremiah chapter, it was like 25, God told him in Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet got up when all this was happening and he said, here's what's going to happen. God's going God's to put you in, in captivity for 70 years. 70 years, it's going to happen. God's going to come get us. He's going to allow these enemies to come in and conquer us. They're going to take us away into captivity and he's going to have us in captivity for 70 years. Jeremiah said it way before it happened. Sure enough, Babylonians came in. 70 years. 490 years. How many, how many years did they... Disobey God. Every seventh year, 409 was seven times seven. 49. 49, okay. It was actually, they were, in, they were in captivity 70 years. So all those years that they disobeyed, God took them back. So if you do the math on that, all the years they disobeyed, and then they were in captivity 70 years, they had 70 years missing of disobedience. God took those years back. He put them in captivity. But that's, that's just giving you the setting. But Daniel is an old man. And he's been in captivity going on 70 years. And he knows the books. And he is burdened because he knows Jerusalem is in ruins. Israel is scattered. The Jews are scattered all over the world. God made a promise years ago that he would bring Israel back and it doesn't look any, in any way, shape, or form like it's going to happen. Jerusalem's still in ruins. They're still in captivity. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. And Daniel is burdened because it looks like God is not going to answer. And God's not going to keep his promise. And so he, wants, he goes to God. And that's the first how-to prayer and fasting. Fast and pray for a specific reason. You say, Pastor, when should I fast? When something is burdening you so heavily that only God can give you peace. You say, Pastor, like what? Let's say your marriage is struggling. Let's say you have a wayward child. Let's say your physical health is bothering. Let's say the nation you, look, you watch the news and it's just heavy on your heart. Let's say your church, you're worried about your church. You, let's say you're burdened about your vision for your life. Let's say you're, you're burdened about your children. Whatever it may be. Something in here and in here in your spiritual life is on your mind and it's weighing heavily on you. When you fast, you fast for a specific reason. I fasted before I came here. And a lot of the fasting was, am I supposed to go to honey and milk? That was the prayer. I didn't pray anything else. I didn't pray, Lord, give me, give me other churches that may be in this equation. There were none. But, you know, give me, you know, is, it, it, show me, you know, I didn't pray for a, a bunch of things. I didn't have a prayer list I fasted about. One thing. One thing. You may be fasting for the, the salvation of a friend, a loved one. You may be fasting because you just want to know God more. And you just say, Lord God, I want to know you more. Show yourself to me mightily. That's, you're fasting to pursue God and nothing else. But don't make it complicated. 
What is it that you need to fast about in your own personal life? If there's something there that you're pursuing, Lord, what is your purpose for me? Maybe you're a young person and you're out there and you're saying, I want my purpose. Where do you want me to go to college, Lord? Who do you, I, I'm dating this young lady or this young man. We've been dating for two years. We, he seems like the right person, but sometimes I doubt if he is or she is. Is this the person? Usually if you have to fast about it, it's usually not good. Uh, you know, but if you're at a point where, you know, you, you know, hey, Lord, is this the right person? You may want to fast about that. You don't tell anybody. It's not something you parade around. Jesus said, don't don't parade around your fasting. Don't don't go tell anybody. It's, it's between you and God and you and God alone. But you keep it specific, specific reason. We pray, pray and fast for a specific reason. And all of godly people who pursue God, there are times in their life where they have to pray for specific things and they fast for specific things. <coughs> Daniel wanted an answer. Therefore, he prayed. And he said, what was his request? Lord, when is Israel going back to where it started? When are you going to restore Jerusalem? When are you going to take our people back? Why was that a big deal? It sounded like a political, Lord, who's going to win the election kind of question. But it really wasn't. Because he knew God, the, the preservation of God's <coughs> kingdom hinged on Jerusalem and Israel being reestablished. Daniel knew that. And so he's saying, in essence, Lord, are you going to do what you promised to Abraham? Are you going to do what you promised to Isaac and Jacob? Lord, this is a promise. We're trusting in this thing, and it don't look good right now. I'm living in Babylonian territory. My Jewish brothers and sisters are scattered everywhere. It looks like you have forgotten us. Lord, where are you? And it said he fasted for weeks. If you read in Daniel chapter 10, he fasted again. It says for 21 days before God showed up to talk to him. 21 days. He was so physically weak. When the angels and Jesus finally showed up to talk to him, he fainted. Which I think I would faint anyway. You know, in the presence of God. But it said that the angels had to stand him up and help him breathe. He was so physically drained from giving God his whole energy, everything he had, that he could not even stand up straight. God's presence and not eating for three weeks, bad combination for standing up. And he just said, Lord, help me. But the second thing in, in how to pray and fast is this. Pray and fast with serious intensity. If you look there in verse 3, it says in verse 3 that, and I set my face unto the Lord God. And he said to seek by prayer and supplication. The word supplication means to pray um, seriously or to pray intensely, making intense requests or in focus, earnestly. Like, this is not just something you flippantly ask for. You're, this, is a, this is an obsession for you. You obsess over what you're praying about. When you supplicate, you, are, you're just keep, you keep chasing that rabbit with God. You're just chasing it. It's bothering you. Lord, what about this? Lord, Lord, what are you doing here? And so you pray with intensity. You say, how do you do that? Well, you give up food. Or you give up something. So fasting by nature is this. Once you've decided this is something I want to pray about. Maybe it's getting a house. You know, maybe I'm not telling you to fast. I'm just saying. Maybe you're looking for a place to live. And you're like, Lord, where are we going to live? Right? Where are we going to live? you got to show us. You, you have a specific thing. Then you know your body. A lot of people are sugar diabetic. They, ha they, they, they have to eat certain things. Their body, they have to eat. You may want to give up coffee for a week. Boy, Americans love that one. They would, you may want to put your cell phone down for the first three hours of the morning. You answer no calls. Maybe after dark. From the time you get home, if you can because of your job, you don't need it. You shut it off. Maybe on the way to work, you're doing away with the radio, all noise. Maybe no TV. I had one, one young man I knew who was a powerful young man of God. He did away with football for a season. Now, some of y'all say... That's no big deal if you're an NFL fan. I don't like it anymore anyway. But uh, this young man loved Alabama football. And so he fasted. He didn't watch one Alabama football game for a whole year. 
And to people up north, that's no big deal. But down here, folks, <laughs> you do away with Clemson football or South Carolina football, or you do away with football for a year just because during that time you would normally watch a game, you're going to go get along with God. You say, that's just religion. No, that tells God and you what's important to you. You say, Lord, I'm going to put away something I cherish the most. Even though it's just a game, but it's something that occupies your life. You say, I'm going to put this aside. Some married couples abstain from physical relations for a month. Just to pray about certain things. They do it together. To pray about a child or something. Some do away with food from breakfast to lunch. Um, I have asked this church on many occasions on Wednesday mornings from breakfast to lunch, don't eat. Fast or do whatever you have to do, whatever you can, but fast on certain things. We fasted for Jordan before he got here, remember? When we were going through that process, I knew he was the guy. I did, I knew because I'd met him miraculously and he was in that staff. And that the committee didn't know how we met him, none of that. But we put him in there with the rest of them, and I asked the church fast for us to find the right guy. That's all I said, because I wanted God to make sure if he's the right. I felt he was. I could have been wrong, but I felt he was. And I wanted this church to fast for the committee that was looking, that they would see who the guy was. And they did. But for weeks, we fasted every Wednesday morning. I had one guy in our church call me <laughs> first week. He goes, preacher, I want to eat my arm. <laughs> it's 11 o'clock. He said, I don't know how in the world you do that. Right? I said, I don't need, I don't like to do it either. It's hard to do. But we fasted for the right person. You know, and, 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 and we fast for a number of things like that. We're going to be fasting a lot more. I believe a church that is strong is a fasting and praying church. And so, but they pray. You do away with the phone. You do away with coffee. You do away with food. You do away with television. You do away with something. And you set aside a certain specific period of time. Don't say, I'm going to do away with eating every day in the mornings for the next 10 months. Then it becomes monotonous. You need to cut it off to a specific intensity. Maybe it's a month, maybe it's a week, depending on what it is. Uh, and you need to have a time frame that you're gonna do this. And you pour all your energy into that time frame. And so you set your face to the Lord. You set aside everything that is craving. And every time, let's say you're eating, you, you're doing with eating. Every time your stomach growls, you pray. Fasting and prayer, Fulton Sheen says, fasting detaches you from the world. And praying attaches you to God. Does that make sense? So when you, when you do away with something you enjoy that's in the flesh, you put that away, you detach from that, and then you pursue God. That's what fasting and prayer does. You turn from flesh to spirit. And every time you crave that, whatever it is, it reminds you that God is more important and you turn to it and you turn to him and it, it begins to move in your life and God begins to speak in that situation. And so we pray for a specific reason. We pray and fast for, with serious intensity, <clears throat> but we excuse me, also pray and fast with spiritual perspective. If you read what Daniel says, many times we miss it. But after Daniel had fasted and prayed for so many days, guess what he began to say in verses 4 through 19? I am a sinner. I am a weak person. I am someone who has a fleshly problem. And you know what, Lord? So does my country. So do my people. Lord, we are in this situation because of our own iniquity. What's happening? And then he says, but Lord, you are a merciful God. Lord, you can give us the answer. Lord, you know what's happening. Lord, you know, you can tell us where to go. Lord, you know what's happening. As he's fasting and praying, he's, he's praying for a specific reason. He's praying diligently for a time frame with intensity. And what's happening is in here, and in here, God is beginning to show Daniel how to look at the situation the way he sees it. That's what prayer and fasting does. It takes off your eyes, and it puts on God's. A teenager told me this. I'm going to fast till God brings her. 
I said, good luck with that. It's going to be a lot thinner. You don't break God into submission when you fast. You don't hold your body ransom and try and, you think, it's like a kid holding their breath when they pitch a fit. You know what my daddy would have said to me? <laughs> Good lung exercise. That meant nothing. Meant nothing. God is not going to be broken to follow your will because you don't need something. And many times people say, I'm just going to fast until God gets this. Till I, God, I'm, going to, I'm going to keep pursuing God by fasting until He gets what I'm trying to say. Until He blesses what I'm trying to do. No, 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 no. That's not what fasting does. Fasting doesn't break God to see it your way. Fasting breaks you to see it His way. And you begin to go, wait a minute. I thought this was a God problem. Daniel starts to say, wait a minute. No, it's a me problem. It's a me problem. Our nation's a mess. And you're doing exactly what you said you were going to do. Lord, you're the one in charge. And the perspective changes when we pray and fast. Daniel came to full understanding of the situation that burdened him. Fasting takes off the fleshly lenses and that, that blinds you. And it helps you put on God's lenses. It gives you a spiritual perspective and it kills the fleshly perspective. Fasting and praying does not hold God ransom. Fasting and praying does not change God's mind. Fasting and praying does not make God love you more. People say, I'm going to fast. I want God to love me more. Good luck. He could never love you more than He does right now. Does it make you godlier than the guy over here? It doesn't make... No. Remember the guy who went and prayed and fasted? And he said, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. Remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got you said you're wasting your time. That's a waste of time. It, 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 that, that means nothing. We don't pray so God will love us more. We don't pray so God will change his mind. We don't pray to hold God ransom. I'll tell you what else. Fasting and praying doesn't change people's minds. Listen, a lot of times we pray because somebody won't do something we think they should do, so we'll fast and we'll pray and ask God to change their mind. Here's one thing God won't touch. The will. He will not touch the human will. He will allow a human being to choose who they will serve. So let's say you have a person who's lost. You say, Lord, save them. I'm going to fast that you'll save them. God, God can't, he won't. And say, God can't. God has chosen not to. God is not going to change a person's will. He's not going to make a person get saved because you asked him to. You say, should I fast then? Absolutely. My grandfather was 80 years old when he got saved. And you know, we prayed my whole life for my grandfather to get saved. My dad fasted and prayed that my grandfather would get saved. But you know what? I remember as a young boy what the, what the, what the prayers were like. Lord, save him. Lord, save him. But as we got older, guess what the prayers were? Lord, just keep him alive just a little longer. You know, all of my grandfather's friends that were at the, at the, at the bar all died 20 years before he did he lived to be 80, 86 years old. He lived and lived and lived. And he drank like a fish, ate horribly. He ate raw oysters and buttermilk together. Yeah. Every meal we had, we, that's a running joke. Pop always had a big old glass of buttermilk with every meal. Cholesterol. Lived to be 86 years old. He was pickled inside. <laughs> but the prayer was, Lord, let him live a little longer so he can hear one more time. Lord, send somebody. You know, and many of y'all may not know who Bailey Smith is. He was the great evangelist back in the years ago. He came to the church in Maryland and he preached a revival. And he told, my dad told him, he said, if you're ever in South Carolina, just pray for, he asked him to pray for, for my grandfather. He said, where's he live? He said, he's in Anderson. And he said, he's usually at the, at the Phillips House of Flyers on Main Street in Anderson. You'll find him there. He said, I'm going to go visit him. Dad didn't think there was a chance in the world that Bailey Smith, the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, would ever visit my grandfather in that flower shop. Sure enough, he went in there one day, walked in and said, I'm Bailey Smith. I'm Harold Phillips' friend. I came to see you, Mr. Phillips. He said, have you ever asked the Lord to save you? 
And he went in with him. He said, well, I, I, my son's a pastor. I, I know he sent you. He said, I appreciate you coming. I know how to be saved, and I will when I get ready, but I ain't ready. But he prayed with him and left. God sent somebody else and somebody else. Finally, one day, a man uh, at uh, Gethsemane Baptist over there in, in uh, Star, Mr. Duncan, Pastor Duncan, went in there began to visit him when he was bedridden, sitting in a chair all day, couldn't go nowhere, couldn't go to the bar, couldn't drink his beer. Finally, that preacher went in there, and he started listening to that guy. And that guy and my grandfather got saved at 80 years old. We didn't make it. We just prayed. The prayers and the fasting and all that went into it for 40 years was, Lord, give him a little longer. Give him a little chance. Send one more person. Send somebody else. The prayers changed. God, he eventually got saved. But the prayers changed because God changed the prayers in the praying. And so God gives us a perspective. And God has answers to our prayers. You know, he'll either say yes, no. You know, there's some things God, God needs to be Dr. No for some of the things that we ask for. God will say, <laughs> you just think you want that. You do not want that. Lord, give me that job. I want that promotion. <laughs> you don't want that promotion. You don't want, you just think you want that promotion. Lord, give me this house. You don't want that house. It's got a bad septic. I know it looks pretty. But you don't want what's underneath. Right? <laughs> All right. So I'm glad God didn't give me a lot of things I prayed for. You go back and look at some of the things you prayed for. Some of the things you asked for. There were certain girls I wanted to be my wife. Thank the Lord. Garth Brooks was right. <laughs> Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. <laughs> you know what I mean? They were good girls, but it wouldn't have fit what, I, what God was going to do with me. God brought the right person at the right time in his time. And so God knows. But we pray also, lastly, with a solemn expectation. Daniel prayed with expectation that God would answer his prayer. God's going to tell me. I'm going to learn. I may not get the answer I want. But I am going to, I'm going to get God to answer. God's going to answer me. And his answer came. God eventually came in verse 20. And he told him. He sent Gabriel. He said, man, I wish God would send Gabriel to me. You know, sometimes God can do it however he wants. But he speaks through his word mainly. And his Holy Spirit. He speaks in other ways. But God gave him an answer. And he told him, here's... You're, you're right, Daniel. The scripture is correct. We're getting close. And the days are coming. And then not only is this going to happen, Israel's going to be built back, but one day the Messiah is going to come. And he gives him a descriptive description of Jesus coming and riding into Jerusalem on a donkey in the latter part of chapter 9. He describes it to the dead, which is incredible. He gives, he gives Daniel more than he's asking for. God always does. Give us more than we're bargaining for. Philippians 4, 6 says this. Be careful for nothing, but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your heart and your mind through Jesus Christ. E. Stanley Jones says this, prayer is aligning ourselves with the purposes of God. That's what it does. It aligns us with His will, not the other way around. We don't align God to our will in prayer and fasting. We align His will and our will. He, we get in line with His will. If you say, Pastor, what do I need to do? You, need to, you got something to fast about? You need to fast about. You need to decide what you want to do away with. How long you're going to do it. And then you need to pray and supplicate with intensity and let God change your mind to His will. You say, Pastor, why did you preach this today? I preach this on purpose. This is, there's a reason I chose this. Because this church is about to tackle some big visionary challenges. And we have to be a congregation that fasts and prays. And we have to be able to fast and pray 
about specific things. This church will live or die by those that are willing to bow and bend and pray. It will live and die by those who are willing to fast. Those who are willing to pursue God with the answer. A few years back, I was on a committee to build a multi-purpose building. It was going to be millions of dollars. Barack Obama had just got elected. We had the real estate bust that same year. All the real estate just tanked. Y'all remember that? We were, gonna, we were about to build a two, it was millions of dollars, two million dollars in that time. It was like five million. And all the deacons and leaders were in absolute panic mode. We were all like, well, we won't have, people are going to lose their jobs. When a Democrat's in office, they cut defense spending, and you know, I have our churches funded by defense spending. They work at APG. They work at, you know, I don't know what's your political affiliation, but that was the discussion. We knew how things would move based on election. That's how they had moved in the past. And so there was all this doubt. And so we agreed. We said, let's do this. Number one, there's a church that needs to be built in the Philippines for about $10,000. Let's give that money from our, our what we've raised already for this new building. Let's tithe it. Give it so they can build them churches. Let's show God that we have faith enough to take out of our money to build our million dollar building and let's give it to build that. We'll show God we have faith that he's going to raise it. And secondly, let's go for the next two weeks or however long and let's fast and pray and let's ask God to synchronize this leadership as to where we need to go. And so we all left in absolute confusion. We went out and we prayed and fasted individually certain specific time, asking God to show us the green light of the red light. Green light of the red light. We all came back in a few weeks, a week and a half later. All the same men were in the room, and we went around the room and asked every person, and guess what? Every single one of them said, we need to go. God has given us the green light to go. I didn't believe it when I sat down, but when I got up, God said, go. Money's not the issue. We need to pursue what God wants us to do. God wants us to build this. Let's fast it. God put everybody on the same page. And so this church, as we move forward, we're going to have the same type of scare. We're going to have the same type of questions, the same types of fears, the same types of... But that doesn't mean God's going to say, oh, you know, I know how things are. God decides. But we all need to be in one accord. Moving in one movement. <coughs> and so I'm, I challenge, I'm going to challenge this church in the next few weeks to start fasting. Because God is going to do great things. And I want your hearts to be prepared. Because really, big buildings and big visions are not about pennies, nickels, and dimes. Those are important. They get things done. But the root of success is prayer and fasting. Father God, today it is my prayer that this church, our church, me and them, all of us, that we will be humbly submitted under you. That you will show us, you will take our lenses off and put your glasses on. Your 2020 kingdom vision. And those here today who may have something heavy on their heart that they need to fast and pray about, Lord, I pray that you will hear their prayer and show them your will. And they will be strong.
age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history you can prove, there's nothing you can do, faithful and true, though the storms may Thank you.